right. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thank, afternoon. You. thank you for letting us into your space here in the Young Men Emerging Unit in the DC Department of Corrections. My name is Amy Solomon. I'm with Arnold Ventures, and uh, we are here because of the transformational work that you're doing inside this unit and inside this facility, and we want to learn along with you. Um, we all just watched our president, Kelly Ree, announce a commitment uh, from Arnold Ventures to prison reform. And we're here today, we want to start right now, we want to shine a light on what's going right inside here today. Uh, we want to get a sense of what it takes to create a different culture and community inside jails and inside prisons. And we also want to talk about what's possible and talk about the national picture uh, and how we can do more of this in other places in the country. So thank you for letting us into your space and to have this conversation. We've got a, a number of people we want to hear from, a lot of different perspectives, and I do want to start with Director Booth, uh, who runs this place. Director, could you talk to us about where we sit? What is the, the Young Men Emerging program, and where did this come from? Uh, so thank you again to Arnold Ventures, and thank you for the men and women that's in this community. Um, I want to say where this came from, Amy, was I had a conversation with Mayor Bowser, who is my boss, um, a couple years ago when I was looking to pursue this as uh, my next chapter of my life. And um, Mayor Bowser, she indicated, what can we do differently for the men and women that we have in our care? And I thought about it a little bit, and I believe the principle that I operate for many people who know me is that I believe in the redemptive power of love. And so in order for you to do this work in corrections um, and to make our community safer, I look through the lens of love and, and chiming off of one of the mentors, the founding mentors, Helene Flowers, who talks about this as it relates to love. And so I look through the lens of love and I say, we have to do something different. And so what we did was we wanted to do this again about three plus years ago, but didn't necessarily have that um, sort of framework. Right, Amy? And so there was a few opportunities that we looked to as far as references, and one of the reference was we looked at Chesser, and Chesser was a model for us to look at, and we are thankful for our partners here at Vera, and that sort of gave us a framework, but we then came back here and worked with our partners, and when I say our partners as it relates to this community, both with the officers as well as the residents that's in our care, and we developed this space that we call the Young Men Emerging. And so this is a community. I wouldn't necessarily say it's totally a programming, a program per se, but it is a community that's filled with love, that's filled with hope, that's filled with um, what's needed. And so oftentimes we survey the men, in, the men that we have in our care to say what is actually needed. And so it ranges from education, to many things, and so I will leave that to my other colleagues who will actually chime in, because I'm sure that they will shed some light on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, Joelle, uh, you are one of the original mentors, and I think that you can help fill in this picture. And can you talk to us about what incarceration looks like and feels like generally, and how this place feels different? Well, it's different in many regards. Amy, throughout the tenure of my incarceration, which spans from 1994 to the present, I've been housed in 16 different institutions. And I can assure you what happens here in YME sets the standard for the nation. Mm -hmm. YME is different in, the, in regards to the fact that we have a daily agenda. This daily agenda consists of the activities going to take place throughout the day. We have a bank here in YME. Mm -hmm. um, my colleague, Michael Woody, who is also a co-founder with me, we create a currency. And we have our own money that our mentees utilize to be able to have access to different amenities here in the community. In addition to that right there, the community has band together. I think the director put together a who's who's list. Um, all hands on deck. We have people from, we had judges that came in this space, and it's just game changing to have presiding judges that come inside this space and have a conversation with the incarcerated population. We also had a historical moment here. We had a, a council hearing that was right here in this YME, where we had the council members of DC board, uh, council members and their representatives that came in here. And that's something that simply doesn't take place in other places in incarcerated spaces, which makes YME unique innovative and progressive as we do the heavy lifting, bringing about the change that is desperately needed. Yeah, well, part of the what's different here and unique is the relationship with, between people who've been in a long time and have wisdom to share with the younger 
folks, and sometimes it sounds like your younger selves, right? <laughs> and you're working with the mentees, and you're one of the people who helps shape what these relationships look like. So talk about that role of the mentor and working with the mentees and what you're trying to give to help offer for them for their futures. Sure. Well, as a mentor, I must admit I wear many hats. Sometimes that hat may, hat may look like being a teacher. I, I take pride in teaching my mentees about financial literacy and in investing. Also, I think as an advisor, a lot of time our guys, they have questions. They, hey, what do you think this is a good idea? How should I address my attorney? Or what do you think would be the best way I can um, to speak at my hearing or at my sentencing, which is a very big thing for us here. We want to have advice about that. So you have a, mentor, a mentee who can come to you late at night and say, hey, I have a court the next day. Can you pray with me? Mm -hmm. Things of that nature right there will just intervene in some of the problematic situations may arise at, in the wee hours of the night, and we intervene and stop that situation right there. Yeah. All those dynamics were not in place when I first came incarcerated. And so I think that having that relationship, building that relationship with the, the younger me, if you will, the person who was once me in the past, and now as an older man, um, I think that that resonates with them and it allows them to listen to the advice that I give, you know, and, and it helps um, bring them towards making a sound decision for their lives, whether it be in their legal affairs or their personal, personal affairs with their family. Thank you. And Anthony, uh, you're a mentee here, yes? Uh, young man emerging. Can you talk about that relationship a little bit and what it means to be working with these um, older colleagues who have been, not older, <laughs> <laughs> who have some wisdom to share and how you all work together and develop those relationships? Yes, I am. Yeah, I, think, I, think that the, I think the relationship is complementary. I think we complement one another. It's like peanut butter and jelly. You can't have <laughs> one without another. And, um, you know, just to have my mentors, uh, you know, Joel, Mike, um, Mama Lou, Jonas, Dirk, Stone, former mentor, uh, Ty, as well as Harleen, to have those men set the example for what productive black men look like when they're engaged, it's just that's a high standard. It also encourages me to continue to be uh, just, you know, eager to learn, you know, and I've noticed changes within myself. I'm more receptive to constructive criticism. I'm eager to go out and pursue just my education and just be a better person overall. Uh, when we talked a few days ago, you talked about family. Do you remember what you said? Um, I think I said not verbatimly, but I do remember stating that um, in this unit, we're able to confide in one another. And when you're able to do something in that type of nature, you're able to trust someone enough to allow yourself to be vulnerable. And I think being vulnerable is essential for finding out what is really needed for oneself and one another. I think that's big here. Thank you. So Tyrone, I'm going to turn to you now. You uh, are also an, an early mentor here on the unit, uh, and you are now out in the community. We were here. We were here the day that you found out that you were you were getting out. You're now a Pivot Fellow with Georgetown. Mm. You're now an intern with Justice Policy Institute. Good, You're doing well. You're setting in the yeah. <laughs> I love that you're coming back here too. Right. And uh, you wrote an article that was published a couple weeks ago, and you talked about how uh, your time in prison was real and it was transformative. And I didn't know if you could talk to us about what did you mean by that? What I meant by that, Amy, is that when you're in that cell and you going through it in your mind and your heart, like when maturity set in, I really did a wrong to society. And I can never say I'm sorry enough to the family that I really hurt, you know, being immature and committing, and, and committing that great tragedy, tragedy against them. And like trying to explain that to them that I didn't really mean that. People are not really receptive to that. Mm -hmm. America's not really receptive to that. But deep down inside, we carry this sorrow and that's real. Because you can say, wow, man, I did, that's the transformative part. I did something that was truly wrong to society and to America as a whole. But I was really unaware of what I was doing because I was a child. Mm. I take blame for that. And me being a child don't excuse, it don't excuse that kind of action. But I did something to hurt people and I'm sorry for that. And a lot of us feel like that. 
And it's hard to like convey that to other people, especially to the victim's family, because that's a pain that'll never go away. And being transformative in a way that I died too. Inside I died because I'm numb to the whole situation. Even being a juvenile and having a juvenile life sentence, I'm numb to that. I don't even understand how that is. I can't even process that. But as you mature, you start to realize the wrongs that you commit. Not only, I mean the small wrongs, like when you're jaywalking, things like that. You, you start to realize a whole lot of things in your life. Those moments were real, and those moments was very transformative. Thank you for sharing that with us. And I would push back a little and say, America, uh, this country is very receptive to that and appreciate you acknowledging that part. Um, Lieutenant Otis, I want to bring you in down here. Okay. Uh, you've been working corrections since you were 18 <clears throat> years old. Yes. Uh, you've been on the unit. You can let us know how long you've been here. But corrections officers are a really important part, a really ingre important ingredient to setting a different culture in a place like this. And can you talk about your role and how it's different um, than in most settings? Um, when I started corrections, um, when I was 18, this was part of my military, and then I got out of the military and went into the, uh, working for the state. Um, it was real different than the setting we have in YME. It was a lot of violence. Um, it wasn't, uh, conditions weren't set for real rehabilitation. It was more, you know what I mean, more punishment um, than anything. Um, here in YME, uh, our partnership with security, the mentors, and the support staff, we focus on encouraging and providing any services we can to help these young men. Um, in doing that, they get the sense that they're in a safe environment, and that allows for them to start the rehabilitation process so they can work on themselves. And that's the biggest key. Um, within YME, all the staff that works here, we understand we're not here to punish these guys. Mm -hmm. We encourage them um, and we, we care for them. We, we share any knowledge and wisdom that we can with them to uh, help them in their rehabilitation process. Um, for me, uh, personally, spiritually, um, this is the most rewarding correction setting that I've ever worked in. Um, to work around these young guys and encourage them and help them any way I can. Um, this is, YME is the benchmark of what correction should be. If we want to fix the correctional system and help these young guys return back to the community in a good way, uh, YME is setting the standard for that. Thank you. So you all have created a culture here where you allow these kinds of relationships to build and to flourish. And I just want to know what kinds of advice you have about how you build a community, particularly on the inside, but all of us would like to build this kind of community too <laughs> on the outside. But, but how do you build these relationships? How do you build this kind of culture and community? And Mike, I'm not sure if you wanted to, to start this off um, and then others can chime in. Can you go? Thank you. individuals to be able to uh, reach out um, and have uh, these dialogues with, with uh, 
uh, Lieutenant Oldest and Andy Michael. Um, we even developed to a degree a working relationship with the director and the deputy director, Wanda Patton. Um, I think that this is something that really has allowed for this space to, to, to evolve into what it is now, which is, we call it a community. Thank you. Do others here want to speak to this question about how you build this community on the inside, how you build relationships here? Yeah, sure. I, I'd like to say something about that. In, in fact, I was having a conversation earlier with Juan and Ryan about the same point. Policy must lead. Mm -hmm. What Director Booth did was having a progressive mindset, writing a policy that gave us the wheels or the framework to work with. Then once we move beyond the policy, then we got the troops on the ground. Mm -hmm. Those individuals that look like my co-mentors mm -hmm. who have over two decades of incarceration experience. Man, I'll be, I must admit, I mean, in the beginning, I had no idea that those stories, that experience, will qualify me today to be an, an, an expert on this field. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, being in those 16 different facilities mm -hmm. and seeing what works and what doesn't work, I'm able to give sound advice to a receptive ear. Mm -hmm. So when a deputy director begin to say, okay, um, I, ha I have an idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so now I'm, I'm driven policy, writing up stuff, submitting a lot of initiative to her. And she said, okay, Joel, this is like a sound idea. Let's move forward with that. That is game changing. Yeah. That's that collaboration. That's what you do not find in other spaces. So if we can just find a way that we can package this, yeah. use this model, scale it out, then we can make a great difference. I don't want to put you on the spot. Do you want to get in on this point or no? You can. Well, I, I, if so, we'll get to a mic right there. The Deputy Director Patton. I certainly agree with Joel's comments and the fact that collaboration is very, very, very important. Being willing to allow the mentors to have a seat at the table has been very important. Also, being willing to really engage in relationship and building relationship has been very important. Had you ever, in a in a setting, in a prison or jail setting, had people who are incarcerated help co-design and create a unit like this and have that kind of say? No, this is uh, my first endeavor. Yeah, well. yeah. Yep. It's been as I often share with these guys. It's been a very rewarding experience to be privileged to take part in this initiative. Great, thank you. Did you want to speak to this, Tyrone? Well, it's like they said, the relationship. When the, the director comes in on Friday nights, walk through the whole unit, cell to cell, no one is left untouched. He's showing that he cared. I remember we had an event, and uh, he asked another mentee, he said, hey, do you wear glasses? And, and the guy said, what do you mean? He said, well, I see the way you're looking over there. You need glasses. He said, yes, I do, showing the level of care. Mm -hmm. When the deputy director comes in here on Saturdays, yeah. said, I just stopped by to see y'all for a minute, and we hold it for three hours. Mm -hmm. Those conversations and that commitment, it, it, it gave us a lot to do. It gave us that real seat at the table. That any decisions that were going to be made inside this unit, we had to be at the table. Yep, yep. And that was very important. It's very, very unique. Um, I. I, I'm not going to be able to get, let me hold it just because we won't be able to get it on. So let me, we'll come back to you, Halim. Um, I want to talk about families for a few minutes and what your families think about the YME, if they feel a difference, how you bring them in uh, to the community here. And I think I'm going to start with Dre, if we have a mic over here and then see, you. oh, Mama Lou, do you want to start? You, and then we'll go to Dre. Yeah, you've got a mic right there. Uh, definitely, uh, YME brought the family in on an epic level. Uh, 
when I since I've been incarcerated for 23 years, uh, 18 of those years was uh, I was unable to see my mother. So uh, here they have a family day. Uh, family day consists of us going downstairs uh, and to the big visiting hall. There's music. There's food. Uh, the staff is able to meet our family, uh, support us, let them know what we're doing in this space. Uh, the mentees are able to meet our families. They tell them about the transition, how we've uh, affected their uh, mentality and shifted the paradigm of uh, you know, crime into doing something more productive. Uh, not only dealing with the support, but the repair. You know, it, it has been a lot of uh, repairment in this space. Uh, Deputy Director uh, Ms. Patton uh, told me a lot about forgiveness. Uh, forgiveness not only being, uh, being able to abstain uh, or refrain from revenge, but you know, actually healing yourself. So that has been a big thing uh, in this space, as well as the community within itself. Uh, all of the mentees, as well as the mentors, as well as the, the staff, uh, has become our family as well. Uh, we eat together, we pray together, we laugh together, and uh, when there's any type of uh, problem, it's really not a problem. It's just a situation that we have yet to find a solution to. We find a solution to it, and then we move forward. Thank you. It's just not common in many places uh, that you would see. Did the question was referring to family. Day. Family, yeah. I wouldn't yeah. be able to answer that. Okay. Did you want to? Did you want to chime in with anything else right now? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, and speak into the mic, please. Thank you. Well, the relationships. I'm gonna speak on relationships. Sure. The relationships I have developed in YME has been most of all with the mentors and mentees, but the bond that I have built with Deputy Director Pat, Director, Sergeant, Lieutenant, the Chapel, as well as a couple of the COs. Uh, is, is an unbreakable bond. One of the most devastating moments of my life, uh, day before my mother passed away, they all came together as one and made sure that I was able to go see my mom a day before she passed away, literally hours before she passed away. So just the support there that I have from YME, I haven't ever even got inside my own community, like in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I never would, would have had that support you know, given to me. So I would say, you know, Wyoming has brought a tremendous amount of support. And I'm a, it's just a blessing to be here, you know, because during any other time of me being incarcerated over D.C. jail, I never got the respect that I got from COs, you know, sergeants, anything, you know. It was just kind of like a, a hi, how you doing thing, and, you know, you're going about your day. But the process of me being inside of Wyoming has just been unbelievable. Thank you for sharing that difficult story. And I just want to make one comment, and we've had this discussion in circle before, and that is that it's incredible that you can find community and support and love in this place, but none of us think that you should have to come to a place, to come to a jail or a prison to find that, that that kind of community and support should be out there in neighborhoods in the city. And so I just want to make that point that you shouldn't have to find that here, but I'm glad if you're here that that's what you're able to find. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Did anyone else want to speak to the issue of family right now? Well, yeah. I was here for family day. Yeah. All right. To be able to go to a mentee's mother and get the real data on him, mm -hmm. right, <laughs> is like, you see, I'm, I'm already getting some leery eyes, like, don't even mention my name. <laughs> because you can go to your mother and like, oh, I didn't know that about him. Yeah. Well, how is he doing? And you can tell her how he's doing. He needs work in this area. Or what do you think he needs help with? Yeah. Right, to give the mentors and the staff member to give us a different perspective of how we can help in areas that she know he needs help with. Yeah, yeah. But to be able to do that, I bought my, my daughter came in, my oldest daughter. And she's sitting around like, Dad, it's cool, right? I'm like, it's never cool to be in prison, but this is all right. This is a whole different space. She said, yeah, I mean, this is to see me doing something as her father. Yeah. 
meant a whole lot to her, and she walked out of here crying because she seen the change. She see, she see me as I, not as the stories that people told that were fabricated in society. Yeah. But she see the real man as a father and the type of work that I'm doing. Bet she's proud of you now. Yeah. Yes, she is. Yeah. <laughs> Director Booth, what does it take to pull this off? What kind of challenges have you faced? What does it take? Uh, it takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would say that mm -hmm. starting off there. Uh, but it takes being intentional about mm -hmm. this work. Um, as I stated before, I love everybody that's in this space. And when I say everybody, oftentimes people forget about the men, who actually, the men and women who actually work here. And so we were very intentional before we kicked this off of having a conversation with our staff to say, what does this actually look like? And so we spend time in sort of um, addressing their concerns, because I think sometimes we implement programs and services and spaces without actually hearing from the people that are doing this work day in and day out. And so I've been extremely fortunate and blessed to have an amazing team of frontline workers all the way up to supervisors who believed in this vision. And so it was the belief that they had that allowed this just thought to become a reality that succeeded my expectation. And so it's a collective community um, that many voices have talked about here today, how we were able, the fruits of the labor, I would say that, but to get it kicked off, we were, we spent lots of time, as far as all of the deputy directors from education to administration, uh, to uh, college and career readiness, excuse me, to the case, to the deputy director for programs and case management, and for operations, literally sitting, brainstorming on how we actually get this done, and allow the space for failure to occur. I think oftentimes in these spaces, uh, we want to be perfect and in this work sometimes you can't actually get to perfection without actually starting and so I knew from the gate I didn't want to be in the same so I would back up for a second and say oftentimes in correctional spaces oftentimes directors um, and sometimes staff we operate in the lens of fear mm -hmm. right and so I had some fear and reservation around this right but I also had some fear and reservation that I didn't want to be in the same place next year because that would just that that would be unacceptable in a lot of cases some of the things that was mentioned by your president kelly like that's failure to me and so how do we change an environment and change the culture and we had multiple steps on how we implemented it coupled with i would venture to say the one piece that sheds light on on this community is that we're forever changing and evolving Right, and how that occurs is by we're allowing people to have voice that at times never had voices. And so that's not just inclusive of the men and women, the residents, that's also inclusive of the staff. Because again, going back to my initial point, sometimes we're, as directors or as managers, we're just saying do it, right. as opposed to how do we actually do this? And when they came back to us and said, I think we can do it, but here's how we actually get there. I think it's an important thing. Coupled with, the last thing that I'll say to you, Amy, is that we explain the why. Mm -hmm. And I think oftentimes in this work, we don't talk about the why. We don't talk about the impact. We don't talk about the brain development from the 18 to 25 and how that's important and how that's needed. Um, and I am happy of where we are, <laughs> but we're not fully there yet. We still have some work to go. Let me bounce it back to you and sure. also get Lieutenant Otison. Uh, you're relatively new, but are there outcomes that you can point to, even observations that um, about behavior? Dis you know, are there things that you can point to about what you've seen so far? So I'm going to go to my teammate first yep. uh, because I don't want to repeat the same thing because yep. he's here day in and day out, and then I have my uh, two cents. So um, I think it was yesterday we did our morning circle, and uh, one of the mentees actually shared that he's finally in a space that allows him to focus on the changes he needs to make so that he can be a better father to his kids and a better husband to his wife. So uh, I see it in them, but when they express it themselves, um, it just confirms that we know we're doing the right thing. You know, it feels right inside and you get to see it in these young men when they start focusing on themselves instead of worrying about, uh, you know, fighting or being in uh, violence, you know, yeah. Uh, I would say oftentimes, unfortunately, in this space, Amy, 
our indicators are always negatively based, right? So it's like, have you had any fights? Have you had any incidents? What are all the negative things as opposed to flipping, on a, flipping it on its head to look at the positive things? Mm -hmm. And so I would say, let me go to the positive and yeah. then I'll go to the other data because I'm sure people want to know about <laughs> that as well too. But I would say we made a conscious decision because some of the mentors came to us and said, hey, this was midway when we were about six months in and they were participating in some of the offerings that we had that includes four credit classes at Ashton University as well as Georgetown University and we have partnerships with Howard and other universities including American. Hopefully I didn't forget anybody, please forgive me. Uh, but they were very conscious to say we want to make sure that everybody participates in this educational opportunity because we know what that exposure will lend itself to. And so what I would say as a positive indicator, and I know we're limited on time, one of the things that was great in just a couple of weeks per se, our Deputy Director for College and Career Readiness, Amy Lopez, was very intentional in making sure wherever they were in their educational career, whether they needed a GED or they needed some level of adult literacy or they needed to be enrolled in college and career readiness, we have 100% of the folks that are now in this space that are enrolled in two some level of college and career readiness, even down to STEM programming, which is amazing because they're now starting to see something that they didn't necessarily see before. Uh, the family outcomes, when again, as some of my teammates mentioned as far as positive outcomes, just the engagement that I've been in here when they receive a phone call and the family member may call, and they may want to not speak to that direct family member immediately, they may want to speak to someone else because there's a connection of community that's actually happening here. And what couple of other outcomes is the, the, men, the men that have actually left this space as it relates to the example to my left, as well as Helene Flowers and others that have left where they're not just going into the community getting you know, employed and things of that sort, they're actually giving back to their community in a meaningful way, and not just this community, but how do they share their life. And then I would say on the other indicators that people um, you know, sort of talk about from a negative sort of space, this community has been open since February 1 of 2018. Yes. And I would say we have only had about 11 incidents that have occurred, but they have not been super egregious incidents. Majority of the things that Joel mentioned earlier, as well as uh, Mike, they're resolved amongst themselves, where they can have that conversation so we didn't have to necessarily go in the same direction, or they're de-escalated because they have the infinite wisdom to see if something is actually happening yeah. that's actually helpful for the actual staff. And so the positive outcomes that I would say is sort of endless that we're continuously looking at as far as the data. And the last thing I'll say, because I can talk about this yep. kind of blue in the face, sorry, is that we have the encouragement of our team yep. that's actually from other officers that are coming over here saying, this can be the example of other spaces. So yep. it's allowing this unit to be a catalyst that we can go into other spaces throughout the jails. Thank you. And I really take your point, though, about positive outcomes. And as we invest and study this issue, I, you know, we are really focused on the positive outcomes too, and thank you for raising that up. What we're gonna do now is shift a little bit from the DC story, we're gonna come back, but shift to the national story and shift to our colleagues, Ryan Shanahan from the Vera Institute of Justice and Juan Gomez from the Milpa Collective about the work they're doing uh, at the national level. This is really unusual, but it's not the only place and that is a good thing. So can you two talk a little bit about what else is going on around the country that's really trying to reimagine prison space. And maybe, Ryan, start with you. Sure, I mean, we really see ourselves in partnership and standing alongside the, the men and the women who work here of YME as a, a movement. We really believe that, to take some language from Drayvon, that what for some people here is a blessing needs to be an expectation. Um, then, so we want to be in 10 state agencies as a part of our initiative, which is called Restoring Promise, which is a partnership between Vera and Milpa that started out as a, a prototype in Connecticut that you've heard a lot about and has expanded now to pilot in a women's facility and in a jail to show that this could, ha this organizing of a, a prison system around human dignity and the principle of normalization that what should happen here should look like what happens on the outside, that the punishment is losing your freedom, not the conditions 
in with which you have to live or work, um, that that could be an expectation across the country. And so we want to take those pilots and start a movement. And we want to be in 20% of state agencies in the next three years. So that would be 10 state agencies. We're in three now. Um, and with support from foundations, we uh, are now going to be taking on three more sites in the next three years, starting with two this summer. Um, but it's really easy to, to focus on the units because it's this very physical representation of change. Uh, the work that you all have done behind this unit is a little bit harder to grasp for people who aren't living it or working in it every day. And so I think that that, that is also what we want to bring out and to change the narrative about people who live and work inside prisons. And let me just say, you all, it's unusual. Uh, you all are doing this together, a partnership between two different organizations to try and take this campaign and this idea nationwide. So can you talk, both of you, about your partnership, how you see it, and how it shapes the ideas you've got and the strategy that you're undertaking? Yes, I think that it's more around uh, reimagining accountability and partnerships when we actually address questions, not just to the field, but within each other. We have to navigate geography, race, class, gender, and a lived experience in a real way, because what we're gonna be asking individuals, leaders, um, mentors, mentees, officials, is exactly what we're trying to live up to. Mm -hmm. We're not gonna be hypocrite. We're gonna be, be authentic, and we are gonna talk about reparations. We're gonna talk mm -hmm. about cultural healing. We're gonna talk about you know, um, let's not just change the dialogue of the units and put paint the walls and bring in TVs, but we're gonna actually address the social historical legacy of trauma, mm -hmm. the intersection of race, toxic masculinity, and wh whiteness, mm -hmm. and how is that at the core of what we're doing and what we're trying to undo and unlearn. Um, and actually, I think the work that's being done here is actually part of the vision. Mm -hmm. It's part of a prayer that this doesn't happen, right? You know. We don't get down like that oftentimes. Oftentimes the intermediary, the lawyers, the researchers on one side and the individuals are formerly incarcerated bring us at the table. We've had to bring our chair to the table. Mm -hmm. We don't even get invited. And when we do, we're always last. So how do we be, become a more credible voice and power, not just a messenger? Yeah. So I think for us, when we got the opportunity to embark on this initiative with this unique partnership uh, with MILPA, you know, I think we really reflected on what we could bring and what we were missing. And as re reformers, as justice reformers, and I speak as a white woman specifically in that field, we've been trained to not uh, listen to, trust, or follow the leadership of incarcerated people. And so our partnership with MILPA is our own reparations for that. It's our own reckoning with the racist legacy that we're inheriting as people who want to be the change that we want to see. And so this partnership means everything to us. Uh, it has um, changed the conversations we can have with people who we want to learn and lead from. And those are the folks who would be impacted by any changes that we can make together the most. Can you talk about what some of the inspiration was behind this work when you started developing Restoring Promise, where this com came from? Yeah, we were really, we looked to uh, Germany of all places, which I think for the US is a little um, weird in some ways, right? This is a, a, a country that has a, a particular history that we know about with the Holocaust and the, the mass murder and an attempt to extinct Jewish people. So why would we go to there to understand like, what prisons should look like? And uh, what we found when we went there was that they looked at that history, they faced it head on, and they said, we won't ever do that again. And so they understand in a very intrinsic way the power of taking away someone's freedom and that they had to tread very lightly with that power. And so they organized all of their prisons around human dignity. And a way we did not have that same historical lesson. We came out of slavery with the 13th Amendment that said we were going to end slavery unless you were incarcerated. And that has shaped and formed our 
prison system in a way that we are all still dealing with right now. Um, and, and so we took the best of what we saw in Germany, the best of what we have in the U.S., which is um, in Germany you don't see as many partnerships with formerly incarcerated people at the, at the head of reform and, and making changes, uh, and really wanted to try something new. And I would just add that I think that the intersection of how we come across, because although we looked at Germany, our conversation was really looking at, let's look at what Angela Davis was talking about, our prisons mm -hmm. obsolete. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about what George Jackson was talking about. Let's talk about what happened in Attica. I mean, we took a whole different, the best of this mm -hmm. world that's international while mm -hmm. also blending the experience of individuals like the brother right here, like you. All the individuals that have been putting in work, blood, sweat, and tears, even their life on the line, and blended it in a way that we can talk about it in a way that talks about research and collaborative research around innovation, human dignity, but also we had to go in places that in the South where the leadership does not look like this, mm -hmm. where the question is, is like, well, I don't see race. How could you not? If you look in this room, it's black and brown primarily. So I think folks are waking up to the notion yeah. like, wow, there's a harm that has been done yeah. and we need to work collectively yeah. to change that dynamic. Thank mm -hmm. you. So we have just one more minute. Can you tell us what the uh, plans for expansion are? You touched on it, but talk a little bit about what's next. So together we want to, again, be in a part of this movement with y'all. And so we have four strategies for that. And that's to be in 10 states uh, within the next three years. We want to build the evidence and we want to disrupt the way that prison research has traditionally been done instead of on people in prison, we want to do that in partnership with. Uh, we want to continue to have this global exchange and we want to expand beyond Germany and Norway to learn what from the best from all over the world. Uh, and we want to lift up the stories of people who live and work here so that people will disrupt their notion of Oz and Orange is the New Black and to hear the human stories behind the walls. Um, you know, there's been a lot said about we don't know what happens in prisons and we need to know, learn more about that. And I think we would challenge that a little bit that we know how horrible prisons treat people. Um, and so we want the stories of the people who have, have survived that treatment to really be at the forefront. I, th I think that we're going to be asking tough questions, mm -hmm. looking for uh, tougher questions and solutions and innovative solutions in the work that we're doing um, just because we have to. I think you know, we're going to bring in the, the, the spirit of W.B. Du Bois so when he talks about what does virtue fit, do when faced with brute force? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what does honesty do in the face of deceit? Yep. And a bunch of questions like that because at the end of the day, um, we can't fail. Yeah. We have families, children, seven generations that we're working towards. Um, so I, as much as we want to work to re, re, restore promise in, mm -hmm. in these units, what we're actually really trying to do is also go back into our communities yeah. and that these individuals go back into the communities, become better fathers, parents, active community members that yeah. who are voting, who are engaged civically and participate in, in, in a civil society where it actually looks like individuals in this yeah. room. That's, that's the goal. That is the goal. So we're going to end. We've got a, about a minute and a half, just 10 seconds each of what gives you hope, either for your own personal future or for criminal justice reform. And Ryan, we're going to start with you and move down this line. You all. Yeah. People power. All right. Uh, for me, I would just say the fact that it's possible that it's happening here in D.C. and in other states and the other, other states want to try this too and that it's so clear that it takes people who are incarcerated, people who are leading, people who are working every day on the units. It takes you know, all of these roles to make it work, but that it's possible. Yes, I'm hopeful about pivoting from this work mm -hmm. to decrease violence mm -hmm. and increase public safety. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, love and just capability of learning. Commitment to change. Yeah. What gives me hope is this person standing to right beside me on my left because he's a living example of what the future can be. That's great. Um, the way we're doing corrections in YME gives me hope. The young men and their resilience and fortitude to overcome the obstacles that have been placed in front of them. It gives me hope to know that when men and women come together, uh, 
for a common goal with the right support and the right resources, um, people can change. And if people can change, the world will change. Thank you. And what we're going to do is we're going to, the panel's going to wrap right now, but this has been an absolute incredible conversation. And what we are going to do is cameras are going to wrap, but let's keep going around the circle and hear from everyone. So, but thank you. Yeah, let's, let's keep going. Peace and perseverance. Okay. Uh, prosperity for this generation, generation five. We're going to take the, and the mic I think we don't need anymore, but everyone speak up. We want everybody's voice. <clears throat> Openness and just embracing different people. Mm -hmm.